Hey there, welcome back to Issue 34. I'm here with one of our speakers for this afternoon who's gonna be presenting an interesting case. Hey there, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yes, yeah, so my name is um, Dr. Kofi Afrifa from Bowie State University. Um, I'm a forensic scientist. I've done this for 12 years. And uh, today I'm presenting one of the most interesting cases that has ever happened in my home country, Ghana. Um, so it's a case that actually gives me goosebumps whenever I talk about it, but I want to share it. It's a case that I feel the whole world needs to hear. The first case of a serial killer in Ghana. So very prolific one at that. Wow. That, <laughs> that already like gets me excited to learn more about it. Yeah. Now it's several hours until you present, but I'm hoping you can give me a little, you know, preview here. Um, tell me a little bit about this case and why it's so compelling. Yes, yeah, so um, this happened between July and December of 2020, of 2018, I should say. And within four months, actually within six months, uh, he was so prolific, he was able to um, kill four young girls. And, you know, investigations several months later by the police led to the discovery of human remains that were suspected to be that of the missing girls. Now, this was actually discovered in an underground septic tank um, in one of the houses where one of the suspects lived before. So it was through intelligence that the police got that information and they drained the underground septic tank and we were able to discover that. And this was the first case in Ghana where we had to use DNA to potentially unravel the mystery surrounding um, this case. And DNA was not really that known in Ghana. Um, even though we had done it, my lab had done it for about eight years. But we needed to let the whole nation know what the outcome, you know, what DNA test is all about. So I'm in the uh, presentation, I'm going to show some interviews that I did. Um, and it was a case of national sensation. So, yes. So that is what the case is about. But it's, it's pretty much interesting because it's been already adjudicated. And the suspect, two suspects uh, who are not Ghanaians, they are not from Ghana. They're actually from Nigeria. And those two suspects have actually been sentenced to death. So, yeah, so it's, you know, that's why I said it really gives me goosebumps when I have to talk about this case. Wow, so there's a lot of, a lot of different pieces in this. I mean, the, the public interest is definitely, you yeah. know, that adds some pressure to it, right? Exactly. But knowing that it's already been, um, already been adjudicated, it's kind of an interesting scenario for then going through the DNA processing. One thing that kind of jumped out at me as you were talking about that was, you know, finding remains in in the septic system. I have to imagine that those samples were not in good shape. Is that is that accurate? I mean, I'm I'm imagining some degradation. A lot of how how easy was it to work with the DNA from those samples? Actually, it wasn't. It wasn't easy. Um, the samples were, of course, degraded because they were in in, in a sewer. Um, but. You know, we modify the protocol, the existing protocols a little bit. Um, for instance, we use something called Tegazyme, 5% Tegazyme solution to do the cleaning, which we believe really helped with, you know, getting full DNA profiles. And then um, when we were able to get the profiles, what we did next was to compare each, you know, each of the profiles from the human remains to surviving relatives. So we had to do each. So for instance, when we pick one profile, um, we had to compare that to four families. Um, um, basically we used the father, and then in one particular case, the father was not available. So we had to use the mother. So we used the mother also to do that. So we did, you know, paternity and maternity testing, and we were able to unravel um, um, the case as it were. And so how did this, what's the end of this story? I mean, were you able to confirm identities for these remains? What, what happened? So we were able to confirm the identities of the remains. In fact, because we found 
four scalps. You know, we know everybody's got one head. So we narrowed it down. We took samples from the scalps, each scalp, um, and then we ran profiles, and then we were able to compare each scalp with all the four families to determine which one belongs to who. And then we also did have the services of an anthropologist. Um, of course, the police pathologists also did their work. And we were able to actually arrange, you know, and I have pictures of that that I'll show. We were able to arrange all the remains because we had them intact. We were able to arrange all of them. And then, you know, we were able to put them together to say, this remains belong to this individual, wow. and that remains belongs to that individual. And we were also able to um, get one other um, professor from, a world-renowned professor who trained in the University of Michigan here, um, who helped us with the identification, you know. So, yeah, it was, it was, really, it was really a very good work that we did. Wow, I'm, I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine the the closure that that brought for families to, you know, to find the remains and have them identified so clearly. That's really um, really incredible work for for the family. And I have to imagine that the that the public reception was also great. I mean, if everyone's so invested in that story, was it big news when you were able to able to do that? Yes. Yeah, so um, this was a highly charged and highly political case. Um, so the public reaction was, you know, was missed because they didn't think that that kind of work could be done right there in Ghana. But we proved it, you know, we proved it. And I said in one of the interviews that whichever family that is not satisfied can always bring their own DNA experts because the human remains are still stored there. So they could bring their own remains, uh, their own um, experts to come do the work and see whether they wouldn't arrive at the same results. Saying that on national television tells you that we were so confident in what we did and we are so proud of that because and I must also say that um, out of this case work we've been able to publish you know some um, papers um, and currently one more is still under um, preparation for submission to um, to a journal for publication. So I'll show that, I'll show that in the presentation as well. Great, that's very exciting to have publications come out of this. Yeah. Do you think that this case, you know, getting so much national attention, being so politicized, as you said, um, what do you think that did for the public trust of forensic DNA work in Ghana? Do you think that it helped, you know, build more public trust in what you're doing? Exactly. So. Uh, initially there were a little bit of apprehension you know some um, people were trying to condemn what we did some too did not believe what we did but after five years I believe when um, they realized that the girls have still not been found you know that really put a lot of trust and faith in DNA work that we've been doing and based on that, in fact, we had a lot of national recognition because I've had an opportunity to present a similar paper on, on this in South Africa. And I've also given talks about this um, at the George Washington University where I schooled. So, um, yeah, so the public trust, I believe, is now back. And based on that also, I had a lot of calls when I was back in Ghana. I had a lot of calls about people who needed explanation um, about DNA work, especially when they had to deal with paternity issues. Um, I did some few consultancies for people as well. Um, because people became aware that with the kind of credentials that we hold, myself and my colleagues and the people who were involved in unraveling this case, the kind of credentials that we had, there was no way we could probably skew the results in a certain direction to favor one party or the other. Mm -hmm. So I believe that it really brought a lot of trust in the DNA system in Ghana. I love to hear you talk about how much work you're doing to, um, to connect with people and to communicate about what you're doing, um, to kind of get outside the lab and, you know, get people um, good, trustworthy information about DNA work. Um, is that something that you that you really prioritize? Is you know making those connections and, and sharing with the public? Exactly. So 
one of the things we did was first of all to um, let especially police detectives come to be aware that such a facility actually exists in Ghana. Of course they were aware but some were not sure what type of samples to, to you know take from the crime scene to send to the lab. Um, so we started moving from station one region to the other um, educating police detectives and officers, uh, first respondents, crime scene officers about what samples to take and uh, we also had opportunity to speak at fora uh, both you know in academic institutions in Ghana as well as outside so I believe that um, sharing all that information um, with people um, especially police detectives and also I was on radio I was on national television um, educating and speaking about DNA testing and educating people and I believe that brought a lot of trust and I'm so proud of it because <laughs> This is the most singular case that actually exposed our lab to the public. And it also did expose my team and I to the public. That indeed we have such professionals in Ghana who are more than capable of doing the most, even the most challenging cases that we can think about. So yes, so I believe that we've been able to communicate to the public. and. Uh, you know, I believe it still continues to work well, especially now that I'm not there. That's great. You know, thinking beyond this case, just thinking about the future in general, how are you hoping to see this work grow in Ghana? How are you hoping to see forensic DNA work make more of an impact? So after this case, in fact, we had a lot of recognition from the president of the Republic himself. Um, from the Ministry of Interior, what we have in Ghana, that is responsible for the police department. And we also have had a lot of um, donations in terms of regions, you know, because obviously we don't, you know, the lab didn't have a lot of resources. But we've had a lot of donations, especially from the American Embassy in Ghana, um, from the other embassies in Ghana, because they recognize the type of work we did. And, um, I believe it's making the work actually grow. My colleagues who are there will always, they always talk to me about how, you know, they usually are not short of regions because the government um, provides. And also, you know, they get donations from, um, from corporate organizations as well to enable the work grow. So I believe it's really yielded a very fruitful impact. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Um, so before we wrap up, I want to ask you, is this your first time at ISHI? Actually, yes. Presenting, yes. Um, it's actually my first time. And I must say that I'm very impressed. I mean, having over 1,000 people present in an auditorium and then I, from a small country in Africa, having the opportunity to speak. You know, I'm just relishing it and I hope it really goes well. Sincerely, I hope it goes well. But it will, I know it will definitely go well because the case is really interesting. It's a very compelling story and I'm sure you're going to give an amazing presentation. So I hope everyone has a chance to, to listen to it and learn from you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here with me. Thanks for chatting with me and telling this whole story. It was awesome to hear and it was a pleasure to meet you. Enjoy the rest of Ishi. Thank you so much and I'm so happy to be here and I hope to get an opportunity to be at maybe San Antonio sometime next year because I'm going to present um, I'm going to write and um, hope that it's accepted for, you know, for oral presentation or even um, poster presentation and then we'll see. So hopefully to be at Ishi next year. Awesome. Hopefully we'll see you next year. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.